Our next speaker is Mr. Gaurav Kailath, a software engineer working with InfraCloud. He's a Docker community leader and a Tinkerbell maintainer. He also contributes to other open source projects like gRPC Go, Fission, and Docker, or Get Involved. He'll be discussing on the topic Docker Container Security 101. A warm welcome to you, Mr. Gaurav. Please enlighten us on this topic. Thank you. Um, I think I'm already sharing my screen, and maybe I'm sharing the wrong one. OK, I'll switch. Uh, I hope everything is fine and I'm audible, because I'll be checking the live stream, uh, live feed, so that I'm not losing any questions like I did last time. <laughs> OK, so uh, thank you, everyone, for having me. Thank you, every attendees, so for being patient and being there on Saturday. Uh, so I'll be briefly talking about Docker container security. It's a 101. I'm neither a security expert, uh, neither I'm a deep diver too much into like cybersecurity or anything. It's just a few things that I learned across through the path that I have been with Docker and a day in day out. So let's get started. So who am I? Like already being introduced, my name is Gaurav and I'm a Docker community leader working with uh, InfraCloud at the moment. Uh, and yes, we are absolutely hiring. If you are interested, uh, you can just look for the career opportunities that we have at, at our place. And uh, and if you're interested in how is life at InfraCloud, you can actually read my blog, which I wrote a few days ago. It's available on my website. Plus, you can follow me on Twitter, and it's there as well. Let's jump right into Docker container security. So basically, what is a container security, what it's all about? Container security, as described by Red Hat, is the protection or making sure that your containers are uh, secure, your application is secure, and the, your containers are running the way that you want them to run. You are, they are not having um, any unexpected behavior. Your application is secure, and the communication is streamlined. This means you now not only have to be worried about the, the application security, you also have to be worried about or be careful about what hardware you choose when you're hosting your servers. And you also have to be careful about what protocols you follow when you are on the network. And, uh, and not just that, if you're using an orchestration orchestrator like Kubernetes, you also have to ensure that your Kubernetes cluster is secure. It's secure enough so that no attackers could uh, you know, breach in, do things that you really don't want them to do. And that way, you're actually securing your application data your user data and that which is the most critical part. So with so we all know that containers are life saviors. They have streamlined the from build process to deployments. They have saved us a lot of chaos. But at the same time, they because they can run anywhere and everywhere from IoT devices to desktops, servers, edge computing. I mean, where it's really difficult to find places where you cannot run containers and which actually increases the surface area where, you, where attackers can attack your systems. For example, uh, a, an application that is running absolutely fine on uh, edge devices maybe, or let's say uh, on your uh, Ubuntu-based servers or where you're running your Kubernetes cluster and everything is fine, when you migrate that application or make a portable version of it and you migrate it towards uh, edge computing and all, it may not be as secure as it was when it was sitting behind different firewalls in your Kubernetes cluster. So with all these enhancements that we have with containers and all, the attack surface area is actually increased. And what exactly is an attack surface area? Let's take a look. So attack surfaces are basically the areas or the exposure exposing or exposed points where your uh, attacker, where your application could be attacked by any uh, for you know unauthorized or for unexpected requests. So there are different attack surfaces that are exposed when it comes to containers. These are a few that I could learn about, and maybe there are more of, and probably they are. But in a nutshell, these are the attack surfaces, and we will look at each one of them in in a brief. So. Um, I will quickly check if we have questions. No, we do not. So let's start from the top. And the hierarchy is in a way that it, it's it's like you're following a pyramid. 
So container, which actually has your application running, exposes the least surface area, and your host OS exposing the maximum vulnerabilities area. So when it comes to container security or the container as an attack surface, we generally look at the application we are running. And we, there is no doubt the application security is what we should be really concerned about. We should be focusing on uh, the, the data that we, that we are exposing and uh, uh, the ports your application exposes, the protocols that we are using for the internal communication or the external communication, which uh, which services are being used, and everything that matters to your application security. Now, when I'm talking about each surface, I'm actually also giving you pointers to how you can fix or work over those uh, vulnerability areas. So, for example, when your application, your let's say you're using Docker and you're running your com uh, applications in your Docker containers. Docker Bench is a tool that is available open sourced, uh, which allows you to scan your containers, basically your uh, Docker files and uh, everything that you have configured for your container to run whether you are running best practices that are described for production deployments. So that is a tool that is available from Docker and it's a it's really nice. It basically has a catalog of all the production based recommendations. So it basically runs your container against those policies. And it gives you the report saying, OK, this is wrong. Maybe this is something that you can improve. And these are the vulnerabilities. For applications, we also need monitoring. The application communication is really important. We may have, uh, if you're using HTTP, even while you're communicating within the stack, it's kind of not recommended. And uh, whether you're using HTTP or you're using gRPC, these are protocols which actually support uh, TLS, so you should be using HTTPS. If you're using REST-based APIs, and eventually, if you're using gRPC, you should be using gRPC with TLS enabled. Even though you can use gRPC without uh, TLS, but it's really not recommended. Now, when it comes to firewall, your your application needs to be reachable from the, from outside world, right? Otherwise, there's no point of developing an application. So, if your application is uh, exposed to the outside world, it has to be protected. It has to be firewalled in certain ways. Celium is an outstanding tool which uses eBPF, and uh, it's a network. It allows you to know about what network, uh, how you have set up your network, what vulnerabilities you may have, what and what protocols and payloads you are having on your for your application. It's a really nice tool. So it's open source as far as I know, um, and yes, it's definitely worth exploring. Let's talk about images. Images are the building blocks for your containers. If there is no image, there is no container. So you have to use up-to-date images. And let me uh, remind you on this. Maybe you're already aware about this, that when you're using images, it's highly recommended that you should be using a particular tag or a particular version of your image. For example, if you are using an Alpine-based image, uh, you're using Alpine as your base image while you're building your final image. You should be using Alpine colon 3.13, maybe, or 3.10, whatever version you want to use. You should definitely not be using Alpine latest because it's like, you know, okay, I don't care what latest points to, but I just need the latest. But that's a really bad practice because let's say if today 1.13 is the latest and then now 1.15 is the latest and you suddenly uh, deploy a new version of your application. One of your old version is now running 1.13 and the other instance is now running 1.15. You may get some unexpected behavior. And uh, you, uh, I'll show you a slide uh, next, an image from a report, which is like going to be scary if you're using images like unknowns. Uh, image scanning is really important. So if you're using someone else's built Docker images, it's really, it's really important that you ensure that those images do not have any kind of vulnerabilities. How you can do it? You can use uh, open source tools like Clear. You can run an instance of Clear, run your uh, images against, uh, you can scan your images with Clear. And it basically, I've not used it by myself, but as far as I know, it gives you a report of the vulnerabilities that your uh, image has. Now. Another important thing is signing your images. Now, this can be uh, seen as like 
a bit underrated, I would say. Not everyone is doing it, but I think it's really important. Even I myself have done signed a few images, but not all of them. Um, so what generally happens is when we use uh, uh, mainstream images like Node, Nginx, Alpine, these are signed by CAs and or basically the admins who are maintaining those repositories on uh, Docker Hub or Quay or wherever. And they sign those images just to make sure that these, to give you an assurance that, okay, these images are authorized and have been, uh, you know, uh, we are we are the responsible people who are making sure that these are secure and to the minimalist they have minimal vulnerabilities at this point the other thing that you can do on your systems is using docker content trust now this one is going to limit your uh, i would say your bubble of images meaning if you set docker content trust as equals to 1 is which is like you are enabling docker content trust you will not be able to use any images that are not signed. And uh, this, this could be um, a difficult situation because you may at the end use some images which are uh, not signed but are really important for you. So this one is tricky, but definitely increases your uh, securities. Image registries. Now, it depends on your case to case based on uh, it could be company based where some enterprises have their own um, private registries but most of us use uh, docker hub quay or something else uh, like azure container registry or G uh, google container registry um, but for having a private registry if you're if you are having a good base of images if let's say if you have 500 um, uh, microservices you need uh, 500 images i think it absolutely makes sense to have your own private registry and expose your uh, um, images through that. But you have to make sure that you, you basically monitor the your registry itself. You have to ensure that you, the host that is running your registry is secure. So it's becomes, it becomes, it, it definitely adds to the securities, which you have, what you have to manage, but it also adds another layer of protection for your images. Now, Docker Hub out of the box provides you uh, image scanning and also provides you vulnerability reports and, and also allows you to monitor how the how the image has grown towards uh, whether it's more vulnerable, whether the vulnerabilities have decreased or not. And however, it's important to know that these are paid services. If you are you're using the free tier on Docker Hub, you will not be able to scan your images. But if you pay, I think that's probably worth it if you have a product that is uh, a project that is uh, really required to have that much of expenses. Yeah, it's totally worth it. Container runtime. We all know that we have tons of tools that are there to you know allow us to monitor the communication that is happening from one application running in a container to the other application that is running in different container. Or, uh, however, they are not so many tools or uh, there are limited tools i would say that allow you to know what's actually happening behind the scenes what's happening inside the container runtime how the things are can be communicating and that is why it's really important that you protect your container runtime from outside so for example you monitor about you you take care of the the protocols that are being there for being used while you're communicating with your application I mean, you, you definitely secure your Docker runtime, like your Docker daemon, and you also secure your host so that wherever your Docker host is running, that's that server is secured. And that way you can definitely um, limit the number of attacks you can have on your container runtime. Now, when, we are, when I'm talking about container runtime, I'm not specifically talking about Docker. It could be, it, maybe you could be using container D instead of using Docker, which is nice cool um you can be using uh i think cryo with this c-r-i-o or you could be using rocket but applies to everyone orchestration platforms now the only or i would say the best thing that comes to my mind when it comes to orchestration platforms is kubernetes plus rbac you can do rbac access controls you can limit the the number of users the number of routes who have access to or the administrators who have access to the whole cluster you can do it very easily in Kubernetes. You can also uh, make sure that 
even the privileged users do not have all the privileges. In fact, you can limit the number of privileges a privileged user can have. I know it could be confusing, but it, it's really great. And you can fix, do something, things like that, which also adds an ex extra layer of protection for your whole infrastructure and application security. Monitoring Kubernetes is pretty straightforward. You have a lot of tooling around it. We have Prometheus, which is great, exposing all different kinds of matrices, not just about the application, but also the Kubernetes cluster, and also about the hosts or the nodes that are running those pods and containers. So yeah, and it also definitely allows you to you monitor pod and container communication. Host OS. I think this is the biggest, and it has always been the biggest vulnerability area. Whether it was before VMs or containers, it has been, I mean, this is the bare bones slide. This is the, this, we are talking about the server where your application is running. We have your, your hardware, your kernel, and you have your host OS, which is basically running your containers. So this is the biggest area. Now, if you're running Ubuntu, just plain Ubuntu, and running your application, if you have configured your cluster and running on top of your Ubuntu surface, um, it is kind of secure, depends on how you have done it, but it would be nice if you can have, uh, uh, modules which could be which are kernel specific modules which adds another layer to your uh, your host OS. I think Armor is the name which is uh, available as a uh, as a mod as a kernel module which you can use uh, to add another security layer. Now, if you're using cloud based deployments, there are container optimized uh, systems, uh, container optimized operating systems, I would say, uh, which are available and they have added these kernel modules by default for you. And uh, I think as far as I know, Azure, AWS, they all provide these um, systems. And they have their own trimmed versions of operating systems that are really good for, for security. And uh, vulnerability scanning, I would say that in the in the layman's term, it's like scanning your system for viruses. Uh, you can have different kind of scanners. If you're, I, I don't think uh, it's really rare when you see uh, container-based systems running on Windows servers. Uh, generally, they, we are using Linux-based systems on for running our production systems when it comes to containers. But if you're running simply running, and let's say if you're having a home lab or you're using, just getting started with orchestration and all, and you're still running on Windows, uh, don't hit Microsoft so much because they are trying to help you with very frequent of security updates and patches with updates. So don't hit them. Just be wise and when you want to update. So this is coming in from Sync. They published a report, and they actually have a blog about this. Uh, so this, these are the mainstream or uh, base images that we generally use, Node, Postgres, Nginx. These are the most used uh, images that are available on Docker Hub. And Sync did an analysis. They publish a, uh, a report in which they expose us how many vulnerabilities are there. And I've just borrowed this from their uh, security report, and which is the link is available at the bottom. Uh, when the slides is shared, you will definitely be able to see it and get to the report. Meaning the images that we are using today are not really secure. So it comes to your own, like, I mean, a lot of web tools are running Node. But I mean, look at this number, 642 vulnerabilities in the node. I mean, are we, are we really secure? And this, this could be really scary. And you may look something like this. Ah, this is, this is really scary. So instead of being overwhelmed, being scared, what can we do? What we can do really is be start doing our bit as a developer, as, a, as a, an ops person, by writing better images, by writing better Docker files, and making sure that we are following the practices so let's take a look at a few practices that I would like to suggest or have followed myself and others have recommended it. Dockerfile, use minimal base images. It's really important that you are not using Ubuntu or like Node uh, latest as your base image. It, I mean, it makes no sense. So, okay, let's take a very simple example. I mean, I know you might be more of a Java developer or a Go developer. Let's take, I will take an example from Microsoft again. It's not that I'm promoting Microsoft or doing something against them. It's just, uh, I just, it kind of reminds me of something that in old ways. 
So when I started using Docker and I was working as a .NET developer, I used my first image as uh, .NET SDK. Uh, and I was actually not developing my application in that, uh, in that image, or I was not even compiling it. I was just running it. And the base image I used was SDK, which was absolutely wrong. Instead of the SDK for .NET, at the, at, I think four years ago, it used to be somewhere around one point something gigs. If I may, I may be wrong now, but the runtime on the other hand was somewhere around 600 MB, which means it has less packages, meaning less vulnerabilities that are available in my, in my, in my final image. So instead of using Ubuntu, Node, I would highly recommend you use minimal images. Um, and in fact, you can start from scratch and add your packages as required, which are really required for your application. Uh, I mean, if you're running a web server, um, or let's say if you're hosting a very simple backend server, you don't really need SSH enabled into it, right? It makes no sense. So yeah, use minimal images wherever possible. Least privileged users. Most of the applications that we run, and yeah, not most, I mean, everything everything that you run inside a container, every process inside a container is running by root. Instead of using root, you should be using a user. So user is actually uh, as a command that you can type in in your Docker file, and it will create a user, and uh, and it will, and you have to configure your system, your application in a way that it it be run using from that user instead of root. Uh, which absolutely makes sense because you know, if any attacker gets into your system, they will have root access, which is pretty scary. And you really don't want that to happen. So instead of root, if let's say if you're, uh, okay, so let's take an example of Nginx. When you run Nginx as root, you do not have so much uh, to handle. It's the default configuration works absolutely great. But when you switch to a normal user, you may have to tweak the configurations a bit. But I think it's absolutely worth it. Um, and then you can run it as a normal user. Uh, also, what you can do if, let's say, a certain certain ports need access to, uh, to be used as only a root user, and normal user cannot use them. So what you can do is you start as a user, you switch to root, and do something that you need to do. And again, you switch back to the normal user. That way, you are not uh, you're doing something, and then you're giving the control back to the normal user. I mean, which it makes more sense. Instead of add, use copy. Add add can be used to uh, add archives and uh, content the content from remote. And when you, I've, I've seen a few Docker files which use add with HTTP, which is absolutely insecure and highly not recommended. So instead, you should use copy because in that way you know what is the source and what is the destination of your uh, of the files or the assets that you're copying into your Docker file on your Docker image. With add, the, one of the problem is that you can define the source and you don't need to care about the destination. Add will automatically create the destinations as required. R use run very carefully. Uh, when I say run, use. Uh, I basically mean you're running certain commands when you are uh, building your image. Instead of having five run statements in your uh, Docker file, which are which is going to like add five layers to your system, your final image. Instead of use you use, use a single run and pipe those uh, make a chain of commands instead, because the number of layers also adds to security concerns. So the less the number of layers, the less the surface area for an attacker. Multi-stage builds, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to use multi-stage multi builds. Uh, when, so you, you start, let's say, if you're building, uh, let's say, if you're using node-based application, you are building, or you, let's say, if you're using Go-based application. So what you can do is you, you can have multi-stages where you build your application inside a container the output, the binary that you finally have, you put it onto a very minimal, say Alpine or BusyBox, whichever works for you, or maybe Scratch, um, use the minimal image and then just copy that binary and execute it. And that way you have reduced the surface for an attacker. In fact, I would highly recommend you uh, use uh, distro-less images. They are available from Google. Uh, I mean, 
to be very honest, Google is the only source that I've looked at. Maybe there are other resources, uh, sources as well that are providing distroless images. Uh, but Google, I know for sure, is providing. So it, it, switching to distroless images al also allows you to make final images that are way more secure. Uh, in fact, in in the end of January or somewhere in the start of February, Docker Bangalore, Docker Pune, and Docker Malaysia came together to uh, to for a meetup. And there was a, one of our speakers did talk about why you should be using distroless images. I will link that video in the references, uh, and you should definitely check out. He went deep dive in why distroless images are way more secure and important. The container runtime. Uh, I already talked about this, but I'll just quickly uh, go on to this. So Docker Content Trust allows you to use images that are signed and are very and are highly secure. You will not be using images. Docker will not. So if you, let's say you set this flag as one, now you do Docker pull, um, say if you're trying to pull from my repository quick dev node slash go server, it will fail. And it will say that there are no, um, signature or no authorization details available. I'll show you if, if possible. And that's why you how you make your um, your system as secure. Um, on, on, on top of that, what you can do if you're running Kubernetes, you can also, even then you can enable Docker Content Trust. And let's say if, you're, you, if you update a pod manifest and you set your image as an image which is not secure or does not have signed, has not been signed or is not being trusted, um, the the deployment or the pod update will fail because you have stopped from accepting or you have said, no, okay, I won't accept any more insecure or um, vulnerable images. Docker secrets. Uh, Docker provides a way of managing secrets. Now I've seen a few and even I've done it myself uh, where we set environment variables in our Docker file, which are like username and password for our um, data sources like databases, which is absolutely wrong. It's a very, very bad practice. Instead, you should be using secrets if you're using Docker. And in Kubernetes, we also have secrets, so you can you should be using them and or maybe use roles and whatnot. So Docker secrets are like uh, you create a secret and you mount that secret into your run, running container. So it's like mounting a volume, and it's, it's like um, you do hyphen fn mount, and you set the type instead of bind, and you set the mount as secret. And that's how you should be um, providing all any secret information or the uh, any you know confidential data for your container. Publishing ports is another one. A lot of us, I would say most of us, do Docker run hyphen D space hyphen P eight zero eight zero, then call an eight zero and nginx go go ahead run yourself, and and what we basically do is we expose that port on all the IP addresses. Like if you are connected to different networks, that port is available for all those IP addresses. You can do like one twenty seven dot zero dot zero. Not zero, not zero, not one, and all local hosts, or if you're connected to a private, another private network uh, like 192.168. Dot blah blah blah, and you can do the port, and you can access Nginx. Instead, what you should be doing is you should be deciding which network interface you would like your traffic to be coming in from. So you should be doing Docker run hyphen D hyphen P 192.168.1.5 uh, colon eight zero colon, map it to container port, uh, publish it to container port, like 8.0, and then Nginx. Now, this way, if you are connected to other networks, which may give you an IP address of 10.0 or something, now 10.0 or something, colon 8.0 will not give access to your Nginx application. And that way, you add some security to your application, which absolutely makes sense. And that's the whole talk it's about. Securing your do Docker daemon. Um, uh, two years ago, while I was working on an application, um, I, I wanted to monitor the the containers that are running on remote hosts. And I was not running in a cluster. I was not running in a Docker Swarm. I was just running plain clust clusters somewhere on the VMs. And I wanted to monitor them. I wanted to connect with them. So I exposed the Docker daemon, and I was exposing them over HTTP. Uh, now, I see a message, a few messages from my friend Arush, who is there in the live chat. Uh, so what Arush actually did 
was uh, when well, I was doing a demo of that application, Arush connected to that uh, SDB because he knew my um, IP address. So he started sending requests uh, through my exposed SDP exposed Docker daemon and. While I was doing an MOK, I just created uh, an Nginx container. I would say, when I refresh my web page, it says, OK, you have five Nginx containers running. And I was like, what? What's 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 going wrong? And then uh, she told me that this is, this is something that you're doing wrong. You're exposing your Docker daemon over HTTP, which is a really, really bad practice. Instead, what you should be doing is uh, you should have TLS verification on, and uh, which makes sure that your um, Docker daemon is not exposed over HTTP. Instead, any client who is sending requests to your Docker is going to be providing the certificates that are signed by the CA. And that way, your, your runtime, your Docker daemon is secure. Now, if you don't know, there are three ways you can connect with your Docker daemon using the default Unix uh, socket. Uh, second one is over S SSH. And the other one is using uh, HTTP or HTTPS. Like you must have heard about the ports 2375 and 2376. So yeah, that's the way you do it. <laughs> yeah, Arush, I do remember. <laughs> OK, so yeah, that's pretty much it. These are the references that I would uh, I would recommend you to do give it a visit. Um, uh, definitely read those. Uh, these are really great articles coming from Sync. And I would like to thank Sync for all the documentation or the content that you're sharing. This is really well, valuable and helpful. The The best practices, the last one is actually, I think, is a video. I don't remember exactly. Uh, maybe the second one is a video, uh, which is from Docker. And it's really great. Uh, let me show you a few things that I talked about, if I can. So. If I do a uh, docker run hyphen d hyphen p like this, and I will just zoom in. So I just started a container. If I can spell docker correctly, do docker ps, I have my container running. So let's inspect this container and see what happens when you, oh, my bad. So what I've done here is I've run hyphen p8080 and exposed, mapped it to the container at port 80. So let's uh, docker inspect. Oops. Now, if you scroll a bit up, you can see that how this the host IP is mapped. So you have this open at this now IP ASS plus anything coming in like anything. Um, those who have better knowledge than me for networks are maybe help be able to what kind of a vulnerability this thing exposes. Like it's very highly it's very insecure. So instead of what you should be doing actually is uh, I will clean my system blah blah blah. Docker run, and what I will do is I will add an IP address, 65.1.5, let's say. Uh, oh, it's already in use. So do we have, oh, these are. Interesting. So if it is there, we can just inspect that as well. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Hi. Where is the ports? Ports is gone. Uh, maybe I'm doing something wrong. No, why I can't have demos that do not break? TRN1. D, F, and P. I think I'm doing it right. Not sure what's going on. Probably I'm messing things up. No worries there. So, OK, but at least you get the idea. So I won't spend too much time there. What I wanted to show you something else. So I think I already have.
so i already have hello world let's uh, what you can do is docker trust inspect pretty print hello world and you will be able to see that uh, it gives you whether this image is signed or not signed so i think i'm having issues with my network so okay so this gives you uh, signatures that are available on hello world and it as obviously this is a secure image so no no problem there instead if you look at one of my images which i never happened to sign so no signatures are available on this and um, which is like which is your way of checking whether this image is signed or not signed this is something you can definitely do so um, with that i think i will pass back the control to here I will and uh, yeah i'll be more than happy to connect with you guys if you have any questions i'll be ready to take them just a second sangam if you are speaking my speaker was off i'm sorry um yeah you can try now it's a great session by the way Thank if you. anybody want to want extra session on particularly on the uh, container security uh, happy to take a kind of workshop and walk you through uh, how you can secure your uh, docker desktop and how you can set up your uh, secure uh, docker environment uh, happy to help you with that it's a great session uh, gaurav thank you thank you i hope you guys had fun um, did we get any questions i kind of missed on the chat yeah you, you can reply there uh, on a discord or uh, oh yeah in the chat yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah